posting. Uh, this is Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easing. This is the regular Sunday video chat. We do this every Sunday at 6 o'clock Eastern. Um, and today we're going to talk with this guy, Tro Troy Sterling Nice. Am I saying your last name right? Nice? Nice. Nice, I'm sorry. Troy Sterling Nice. And this book. Oh. Oh, I'm Hi. sorry. Reber Clark. <laughs> And both of those guys are Lovecraftian composers, and I also have with me Joe, author Joe Kohler, author Pete Rollick, author Rick Lay. God, I always do that, don't I, Rick? Oh, you got my name right. I did. Okay. All right. So they just, uh, just say the usual suspects. Yeah. You know, they will assist me in in grilling these guys. So grill away. <laughs> so anyway, um, why don't you guys pretend like everybody watching doesn't know who you are and kind of explain what you do because you guys created a lot of music for the H.P. Lovecraft historical societies, movies, and audio dramas. So maybe start with talking about all that stuff and who you are and what you do. Go ahead. Age us. before beauty, that means you, Reber. And pearls before swine. Well, there you go, that too. I wasn't going to say that. Well, that's all right. Um, I'm a newcomer to the HPLHS bunch. Troy has been there forever. Um, but I've been writing music for concert band and orchestra publishers for 30-something for years. I've been in love with Lovecraft since high school. And when uh, I think Troy had uh, some conflicts with scheduling with the HPLHS, I, I told him I'd be Happy, more than happy to fill in, and they called me for uh, some theater things at their theater company, uh, Theater Banshee, and uh, then they used me on Charles Dexter Ward, and I was just really appreciative and happy that they uh, gave me a call. Um, didn't you do another? You did another Lovecraftian little film. I don't remember how long it was. Lovecraft Paragraphs, it's on YouTube. A lot of, a lot of people said it was way too long at 33 minutes. <laughs> uh, it was called Lovecraft Paragraphs, and I nobody was hiring nobody was hiring me to do movie things, and I thought, well, I'll just make my own damn movie. <laughs> yeah. So I grabbed a bunch of images and, and wrote the music for it and submitted it to the uh, film fest in Portland, and they accepted it, and it just I just loved that. And so I went out there and started to meet everybody, and... Uh, then Chad Pfeiffer and Chris Lackey uh, needed music for their the HP Podcraft um, podcast, and right. so they they accepted that CD and use it all the time, and the name got out there. And I really, I just it's taken off for me. It's been exciting because Lovecraft is one of the things that I've been into forever, and I thought no, nobody around here knows who he is. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I thought it was all about myself. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I was all by myself, and so finding this group of people was just fantastic. Uh, I still write for concert band publishers and, and that stuff. And uh, yeah, uh, Can you describe Lovecraft Paragraphs for those who haven't seen it? It's not exactly a movie, right? It's No, it's, uh, it's disjointed paragraphs that have stuck in my mind. Uh, Joyce Carol Oates, there's a quote by Joyce Carol Oates that says his... Uh, you know, certain scenes and certain paragraphs stick in your mind even after the plot details have uh, gone away. And I came through Le to Lovecraft through the books, not through comics or movies or anything. And uh, these these paragraphs just stuck in my mind, so I thought I'd put them, on, I'd put them all in one place. And uh, I didn't have any money, so instead of hiring narrators, I used synthesized voices. My justification was that Lovecraft, there's a quote, he was writing Frank down that long, I think, and he says uh, that he likes a story to be told from an utterly impersonal point of view. And so I thought, well, this is pretty impersonal. But at 33 minutes, I got a lot of protests <laughs> for these electronic voices going on so long. I, the, I, I, liked actually, it. I actually liked it. Well, thanks. Yeah, me too. I thought it worked yeah. pretty well. So. Yeah, I, I was happy with it. I, tri I do a lot of things different now, but uh, it was great. It was great. Well, great experience. Tell the naysayers that the express elevator to hell is a speed button. <laughs> yeah, I probably wouldn't be that tactful. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well it's a, everybody's Michael, a Davis always tells me it's a family show, so I was trying to be 
a little polite. Okay. Yeah, it's a goddamn family show. Yeah, damn it. <laughs> the man can I say can sons of bitches? No. Yeah, I could say yeah, sons of bitches. Now, yeah. You know, I, when I watched Lovecraft Paragraphs, it's been a little while, but I remember I heard the, the you know, the, the electronic voice, and then I was like, you know, that works pretty well, actually. I, I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, the, the voice right away. But the so, voices were yeah. developed by a company called Kepstrel, and uh, I thought they were pretty close, you know, close enough. And there were four different characters, so I thought I thought it worked okay. Yeah. And mostly, yeah. I got permission for most. I got permission for most of the images, but the reason I'm not selling it is some of the images I couldn't track down who the owners were, oh. and so I was a little scared to charge any money for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they won't reply to you until they see that you're making money on it. Then yeah. Like, yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. Yeah, then you get the Harlan Ellison letter. Well, but I like Harlan Ellison. I like his... Well, so don't I. I got, and I agree that's with Harlan Ellison. But I don't want to fight that fight <laughs> if I don't have to. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you could just do what I do and ask people to donate. We'll see if that actually works or not. Yeah, actually, for the images I did put up credit for, they were all donated. I didn't. Have, I think I paid for one, and it was yeah. a, a blanket license thing. But everybody else was <laughs> very happy that I asked for permission. Hey, Joe, your mic's doing that thing again. Yes, boss. Okay, thanks. That doesn't mean you don't talk, though. Because you promised that you'd grill Reaper pretty mercilessly, so. Oh, good. Let's go. I I did not say anything like that. I I like Reaver. Well, I you're like the one, Davis. That Boy, you're the one, Davis, who's going to get the crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to also mention I'm really not a performing musician much anymore. It's all writing. It's been writing for a long time. I used to play trumpet, and I was on the road with Sam and Dave. I don't know if you remember them. They did I'm a Soul Man and Hold On, I'm Coming, and all that is a rock and soul. Oh, yeah. and, uh, but I haven't really played in a while. It's been pretty much all writing. So. Yeah, I'm the same way. I used to play piano and clarinet for years, like 20 years, and I got into some composing. I haven't done it in a while either, but I, it's, it, it's more satisfying to me. Yeah. So that's, that's why I'm so interested in what you guys do, because I have, I have a, a relationship with it, too. So you, you Reaver, you took over with Charles Dexter Ward. Do I have that right? Which is the latest audio drama from yeah, I pretty much the Social the, Society. Yeah, Troy was finishing up his physician assistant uh, exams and, and couldn't uh, swing the scheduling, so they gave me a call, and, and I was really more than happy to fill in. I hope I can do some more for him. So okay. Troy, you did you did all the previous autos and uh, sorry audios, and did you do both movies? Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, I started with Call of Cthulhu in 2005. That was my first project with HPLHS. Uh, in in the interim, you know, we were talking about well, what's next, and we started with the the Dark Adventure Radio Theater series. And uh, so yeah, I did uh, four episodes of those. Uh, like Reaper said, I was tied up with school, grad school, and uh, just couldn't swing it, give it the appropriate attention I wanted to. So I had met Reaper at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Uh, back when we uh, screened Call Cthulhu there, and uh, we kind of just hit it off and talked over the years online, and it's progressively gotten more and more uh, regular. And you know, I mean, we have we've had this discussion where, if you remember back in the uni Universal Picture days, a lot of the composers of, of film were actually like a staff. There was a team of mm -hmm. composers, and I, I I have this vision that you know um, a group of us. Uh, Lovecraftian composers will come together and work on a project, and that's something we'll talk about later. But it, it's coming to fruition now. So, you know, we all share this this uh, passion for Lovecraft and, and translating his his words into something that we can hear musically and and to couple with pictures. So, it's just it makes sense that all of us can combine our creative efforts into something that the, the greater public can enjoy. So, well, I, I want to ask you about the project. I want to talk to you about the movies. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also, before I do all that, I want to ask, uh, you know, I think that 
Yeah, what you just said um, struck me about you know uh, Lovecraft's words and translating them to music. I, I'm paraphrasing what you just said, obviously, but uh, you know I, I I think that some people there's a lot of people that that hear it as this hard metal type music, and I I never have. I don't. Um, I mean, you know, if if someone does, that's fine, but. I, I always hear it in my head as more of this this kind of this dark, mysterious, maybe if Steve Roach was depressed as hell or something, you know, type thing. So uh, what, what do you guys think? Well, I think like Beethoven, Wagner, all those guys, they were the heavy metal guys of their day. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it speaks differently to everybody. Everybody who reads something will interpret it a different way. It's what their mind's eye is telling them. And, and with, as far as me, you know, when I read a book, I, I think of pictures and I'm music at the same time. So uh, it just depends. You know, Lovecraft's been translated for different uh, genres and time periods, and people constantly are inspired and, and rip off, you know, ideas of his and, and try to modernize it. So I, I don't know that any one genre of music is the perfect fit for his writing. I just think that it depends on who's listening is what you they don't want. think country music fits it perfectly? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. You never know. I mean, that could be that quite the juxtaposition with uh, horror there. <laughs> some of that, some yeah. of that back, backwoods Innsmouth stuff, maybe. Well, that's true. That's true. I say that, and then there actually is, there is a connection. Yeah, I mean, there. seriously, you could do... Um, the, the movie that Burt Reynolds did. Um, oh, uh, Deliverance. Deliverance. Yeah. Exactly. With In's Mouth. It would be very easy to do. Yeah? Yeah. You got a pretty mouth. <laughs> oh, you had to go there, didn't you? Oh, yeah. God. You know, that's one of those movies that is very, very good that I just can't stand. It's a great movie that I can't stand to watch. Yeah, right. it's hard to watch. It's, it's yeah. disturbing, yeah. 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 Uh, well, obviously... Your personal feelings about what you hear when you read Lovecraft or what you translate it to in your mind, then that's different from, you know, if you're working with these guys, these filmmakers and these audio drama creators. And do they, how does, let's talk about the films first, Troy. How does that process work and how do you think it differs from, let's say, Hollywood stuff like Hans Zimmer and stuff like that? I mean, do, do the guys at the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society say, I, I want a certain kind of sound, or do they say, run with it? What, what do they do? Well, you have to develop that relationship. I think now they just they trust our judgment and will say, run with it. Um, yeah. But you have to build that up. It's not something that just instantly comes. I think even with the A-list composers that are doing the big-budget films, there that still has to exist. But, you know, you think of, like... Um, uh, Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, they've known each other for years and years and years. They just know what they're going to do, and, and there's probably not as much dialogue there. But, yeah, that was part of the challenge was initially creating a dialogue with um, Sean Branny and Andrew Lehman, you know, that uh, for Whisperer, you know, we kind of had the dialogue that was on and off, on and off, and I would, you know, send clips and things, and, and eventually we decided on a tone for the film. And that's that's something that's born and dies and is reborn with every project, pretty much. Yes. It was the same process on Charles Dexter Ward. and uh, But, boy, being able to sit at the computer and upload the tracks, and then they could download them in L.A. right away, because I'm in the Chicago area. They could listen to them, critique them, give, tell me what changes to make, and then get it right back to them the same afternoon. That has really been a great wonderful thing. Technology yeah, is really made. It like 20 years ago, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, well, 20 years ago, I was hand copying everything with yeah. an Osmeroid uh, ink pen, you know. And, uh, yeah, computers have made it a lot easier. Yeah. Um, is, I still have my callus. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I still have my callus where uh, I did all the hand copying, the entire <laughs> scores and Parts, man. It's like it'd be like handwriting every one of your novels, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or short stories. Uh, Troy, is the process for like doing the audio drama different from the movies? Yes, because um, well, what's similar is that 
uh, when I've worked with them, I'll ask for a script as soon as possible. And mm -hmm. what that does for me is I'll sit down and, and see where segues need to be. I know where obvious changes in chapter are, um, things like that. But um, where it's different is, is that you really have to pay attention to not overcoming or burying the dialogue because um, with film it's easier to have a lot of music going on and sound effects along with the picture because the human ear can sort of separate all that but when you have just the radio drama you have dialogue sound effects and music and there's nothing to watch so it's easier to become muddy and exist within that that um, the, the human speaking you know, frequency range. So it's a lot of time making sure I'm not uh, stepping on the lines. Yeah. Um, I suppose it, it's it's you almost. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. Obviously, but I suppose it's almost like you, in some cases, don't want them to notice the music as much. It's there. I mean, it's subliminally subliminally creating the mood. Uh, but not overpowering the script or the audio, I would assume at any rate. Right, and and with the serialized stuff that, like the radio shows, if you listen to most of the early ones, the music really wasn't there until there was a chapter change or, or obvious end to a section, and it segued. It rarely was actually going on while the dialogue was was happening. Yeah, so is, is that of, easier? I would imagine it is. Oh yeah, because there's less music to compose then. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Reber. What do you think? Uh, it seemed like there was an awful, awful lot of music. I think in Charles Dexter Ward we have 62 cues. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that was a double disc project. So right, right. But you're right. You have to stay out of the way, and that's something I had to learn. I was, uh, you know, first Sean and Andrew and I had to have a a working language which we had not developed. You have already developed with them, so we had to develop that pretty quickly. And then uh, the musical language, trying to stay out of the way of the lines. It's more like writing for a play, um, a stage play, than it is anything else. And uh, but we came, we came to a good uh, compromise on, on everything. I thought I thought it turned out okay. Um, how did you get into the? Well, I know how Reber you took over for Troy. Troy, how did you get into the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society stuff? Well, I. I was looking at writing music for, I, did, I had done a lot of student college films and things like that, projects of my own in, in junior high and high school and college, but um, I had a, a pretty strong love of science fiction and fantasy and kind of how I got into Lovecraft was my grandmother used to give me a book every summer to read when I'd go and stay at her farm, and this was when I was like fifth and sixth grade, seventh grade. And we, we had this, uh, you know, pattern where she'd give me books. So the first book she gave me was The Hobbit. And then the next summer I got The Lord of the Rings. And, you know, she was a Renaissance woman. She was this gal that wore cowboy holsters that she had a pepper and salt shaker. And, and she'd go out and dig a potato out of the garden and eat it raw with her pepper yeah. and salt. All right. <laughs> you know, she carried a Bowie knife and wore men's flannel shirts and stuff. She was a pretty awesome gal. Oh, yeah. And she was very well versed in literature and, and – uh, developed this, you know, love for fantasy and science fiction for me at an early age. So years later, I went to the farm after they had passed, and the farm was caved in on itself, and I went to where her bookshelf was, and I actually found a bunch of books, and I knew this was going to come up, so I found, this is the book I found, The Doom That Came to wow. Sarnath, and this was the next book in line in the, the, the row of books that she had, and this was the one that I, I'm assuming she would have given me next. So, oh, wow. of course, I had to read it. <laughs> yeah, that's, and this, that's really great. I was in the, the seventh grade, I think, at the time, so it's between seventh and eighth grade. And uh, that's when I started with Lovecraft, and I was just immediately hooked. I said, what the hell is this? You know? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so there was a row of books after that that I, that I got, and they were, you know, just that continuation of, I don't know, what are these books, the Valentine books. And uh, there was other things like um, just, you know, all the, the old tour fantasy and things like that were in there. So, you know, I, I was looking up some more information on Lovecraft, and I saw some guys were making a, a, a silent film for Call of Cthulhu, and I thought, no way. This is awesome. 
So I went to their website and I was reading their blog and it looked like they'd already finished it. So I emailed them and I got the typical thanks but no thanks uh, email. They already had a guy lined up. And then like a week later I got a uh, an email with the phone number and I, I talked to Sean and basically they had lost their composer and uh, they had less than a month to uh, get the music together because they were going to premiere it at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival in Portland. And uh, I, so basically I had to write as much music. They said, send me as much music as you can, you know. So <laughs> I just, I furiously wrote and like, actually I went three days without sleeping. Holy cow. This was what I felt was my chance, you know, my chance to get my foot in the door. Yeah. And, um, so that at the time I was really writing a lot of pure orchestra works kind of an oddball thing for a kid my age at the time and and uh, nobody in the area was doing that sort of thing so it was very period feeling and uh, I sent it to them and they said perfect send us more so I kept doing this for about three and a half four weeks didn't think they'd use much of it but it ended up being pretty much the lion's share of the film it's much to my surprise and uh, you know there was there was a few other things uh, here and there but uh, so that's how I got my foot in the door, and then of course uh, the dialogue started with the radio series, and uh, eventually Whisper in the Darkness. Well, and I imagine uh, Whisper was quite a bit different than Call of Cthulhu, because Call of Cthulhu was a silent film, and Whisper is not. Right. So I had I had done a bunch of uh, other <clears throat> independent projects from Call of Cthulhu in between, so I I had already developed my workflow, mm -hmm. and um, was pretty ready to go with Whisper. The thing that was different was is that I offered to be on set uh, for the filming because I also can do on-set recording things with uh, boom poles and recording actors and all that sort of business. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, had the opportunity to start from the beginning with them. We uh, drove a Penske truck uh, from Los Angeles all the way up to Vermont with all of our gear in record time, and uh, you know, was on set for almost everything. Um, well, everything there anyway. And then we drove all the way back, and I helped them build the uh, the home that you saw in the film. And um, I kind of wore a lot of hats at that time, just because we we all did. We all had to, you know, take a lot of different roles. So we went and picked up props at uh, all the different big movie movie studio uh, facilities and and brought them back to the sound stage and, and painted sets and dress sets and, and then assisted with recording on set. And then, uh, you know, I went back home and, and while I was, well, actually, while I was on set, I was actually writing. I had a portable rig because I'd hear things while I was watching them film and after sleep being sleep deprived for a number of weeks, uh, you know, you start hearing things. And uh, so I put that yeah. to work. <laughs> and... Uh, ended up uh, going back home for a while and then we had to do a few more scenes, uh, the cave scene which we went back to Bronson Canyon and filmed there um, for the whole ritual scene at the end of the film and uh, so I brought my son with me and we helped him build the set and uh, you know it was a blast. How so we went you? back. Yeah. How several old times. is your son? He's 16. Oh okay. Well, you, did he get a kick out of it? Did he really enjoy oh, it? Oh, yeah. Him and Barry hit it off real well, Barry Lynch. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he was kind of our grip uh, that, that weekend on the set and climbed up the the uh, trellis, the uh, Migo trellis, and, and uh, you know, threw stuff down it. And uh, him and Barry would banter back and forth when, when Barry was hanging from the, the scaffolding. So, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> do, do those guys have... I I probably should keep up better than I do, but I've got so much stuff coming at me. Do do they have another movie um, that they're thinking about in the works or? Well, or, yeah, I, I, I think know. immediately after Whisper, there was we got to do another one. Yeah, yeah. but they're very tight-lipped, understandably. <laughs> yeah. About what that might be, I don't even know. I've I've not heard any speculation or anything, but everybody has their favorite film idea for it. Um, you know, I think at uh, Lovecraft Film Festival, I said I'd, I'd love to see um, Insmith, Shadow over Insmith, uh, 
you know, but after yeah. rereading some of the stories lately, there's there's quite a few that would make for some great films. I think someone needs to do like a a, a TV series of short because there's so many short stories that he's done. That's a good idea. You know, like yeah, uh, I, and I don't even know how someone that isn't a big film uh, studio would even do Mountains of Madness. You know. Yeah, the thing about not that I know remember, about filmmaking, I don't. You got to remember with HPLHS is that all of us are very much to uh, being true to the story and staying close to detail and making it believable and and yeah. all this sort of thing. I've pitched the idea that they should come here to North Dakota in the winter and do a <laughs> with all of our snow and horrifying <laughs> yeah. weather up here. Uh, yeah. It'd be a lot cheaper than going to Alaska or something, you know. Uh, or Antarctica. <laughs> well, yeah, that too, but you know, that wouldn't surprise me. Uh, you know, attention to detail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, um, Innsmouth would be a good one. Um, but yeah, we we'll guess we'll just wait and see. Yeah, the problem with that is you'd have to get some port city that you could demodernize. You know, it would be or, or go to them and say your your city's a piece of crap. Can we use it for a <laughs> film? <laughs> Yeah. So Newark, Philadelphia, <laughs> portions of Atlantic City, portions of Chicago too. Yeah, pretty yeah. Good. yeah. Yeah. I always thought Shadow Out of Time would be. <laughs> that's that's one of my favorite Lovecraftian stories, yeah. Shadow Out of Time. And I really, really, uh, I've liked all the audio dramas that they put out. Um, anybody that knows me knows that I'm a huge fan of audio drama. I've always listened to old time radio and, and so forth. So naturally, you know, you mix that with Lovecraft and I'm I'm pretty happy. Uh, so I've enjoyed all of them, but I've listened to the Shadow Out of Time probably five or six times. It's my favorite one. Yeah, there are some shots of Troy uh, working out on the didgeridoo for that one, if I remember one, right. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we wanted to give that sort of uh, authentic uh, Aboriginal feel to it, so... Uh, we did use a, I recorded a, a digi in a, a garage, and uh, my son and I climbed up all kinds of stuff and blew on things, and <laughs> yeah, it, it was <laughs> it was fun. I think, you know, as you, you bring that up, and I think that one, sound effect-wise, Foley-wise, is probably the most chilling to me. Mm -hmm. Sean Brownie did a lot of some of the, uh, you know, the screeching and the, the horrifying noises that are that are in that one. He's he's getting to be quite Fun adept. <laughs> yeah, he's getting to be quite adept at uh, some of that stuff. So, and it you know it gives me a chance to focus more on the music. So, he probably just reads some of the emails he gets and then screams and has a recorder yeah. nearby. Oh, yeah, uh, he's <laughs> he's given us into some uh, insight into some of the emails. <laughs> yeah, I, I can relate a little bit. Um, you mentioned a project earlier you guys were working on. Do you want to talk about that, or is that for another time? Or? No, Go ahead. Uh, Troy, actually, it's, Troy, it's Troy's idea. He, mm -hmm. came, he came up to me at the film festival in Portland and said, you know, we've got several Lovecraftian composers here. Maybe we should think about doing a compilation CD. Right. So we talked to Will Severin and Mars Homeworld and oh, uh, yeah. put together a project of uh, everybody doing maybe three three tunes a piece based on uh, Lovecraft stories. Uh, it's entitled Out of the Eons, Music from a New Dark Age. And um, I think there's a Facebook page up now. And uh, I think we're going, the, the idea right now, we're all kind of writing it right now, so it's kind of nebulous. But uh, the idea is there'll be a maybe a narrator will do an intro from the story and then the music will take over and maybe there'll be a little bit of tag narrator at the end of each piece. And everybody's just allowed to do whatever style they want. Some people are collaborating with other guys. And, uh, yeah, it should be interesting. There's some orchestral stuff. I'm sure there'll be some heavy metal stuff and some ambient stuff and uh, just all kinds of Yeah, I just, I just pulled it up. It is on Facebook. Um, when do you guys anticipate that you're going to release this? Troy? <laughs> well, I, I think the goal is that we'd really like to be done by the time Necronomicon hits. Yeah. I think anybody that's doing anything production-wise or, you know, um, sales-wise wants to get their stuff done before Necronomicon so that's available. Because then, yeah, because you know, I heard one or two people might be at that, that function. <laughs> yeah, one or two. 
it's a little known event, you know. But. Yeah. Yep. So that's the goal. We're hoping to to be done by Necronomicon so that it's available. You know, I think in this day and age, most everybody wants digital download, and that will be certainly the the focus. Um, but that said, I am also looking at uh, getting some artists or a, and artists involved. I don't want to say who just yet because it's not uh, solidified. Yeah. But that also is such an important part of this. I think is that you know I, we we built a good uh, network at the film festival and um, continue to plan to do that. I think us creative types can coexist quite well sometimes and uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, help each other out. But that is. Uh, well, and, and obviously, you know, Joe and I have, and and Rick and Pete, we've talked about this many, many times about, you know, what a great family Lovecraftians are and that we're all very, very willing to support each other. I mean, obviously that goes for Lovecraft Easy, and if you guys keep me posted, I'll I'll promote it as much as I can. But but yeah, it, it's 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 a great family to be involved with because whether you're a composer or a writer, everyone, they're, we're all trying to promote each other. And there's there's very, I, I see very, very, very little of, of a competitive spirit. It's all everyone trying to promote each other. Yeah, I was talking, talking to Nick Gucker, the artist Nick Gucker, about this, and he said, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. So we yeah. get all pull for everybody. I mean, it just brings everybody else up. So there's, I don't see a reason for any conflict, you know. Except, yeah. except that Pulver guy, I don't know. Yeah, well, he's, he's Actually, so good. But okay. what, I was going to say the talent pool, the, yeah. the talent pool that we currently have in the Lovecraftian community, be they writers, be they musicians, be they artists, is is particularly high caliber at this point, yeah. and it's easy to support. I mean, you know, whether you're a musician or a writer, and you're looking at somebody like Nikki, Nikki Gucker. Um, that that's great art. It's he's catering to what we love. He's doing magnificent work. When our you know our, our what the HP uh, Lovecraft Historical Society is doing with the films, um, Call of Cthulhu is is this gem. It, it's absolutely stunning. You know here we all are for however long waiting for a real Lovecraft movie and yeah. here comes this thing and it's it's knocked clear out of the park yeah the everything movie. everything from set design to music you know so it's it's really easy to support and appreciate you know the other members of the community uh, with this talent pool um, it, it's I, 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 I think we're living we're living in a golden yeah. age yeah and we're, and we're lucky yeah you're right. Yeah. The internet's helped out quite a bit too, but I think that you know the the spirit of Lovecraftians, you know, just it, it it's just a great bunch of people to be around. I really enjoyed being at the film festival. That was my first time to anything like that, and you know, oh. meeting you guys, and and so even more people at Necronomicon. So you're trying to get it done by then, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and and something else I should mention. Um, you know, if you were if you were at the Lovecraft Festival Film Festival in Portland, you may have caught our production of At the Mountains of Madness. We did a live version uh, adapted for stage of the At the Mountains of Madness, and um, that will be redone again at Necronomicon. And uh, Reber and I will be taking up audio duties again. Um, at this time, I believe Andrew Lehman will also be able to attend, so we'll have the the two bosses there on stage and probably Mike Delliger as well. So uh, we will be doing a, a redo <laughs> in Necronomicon. So that's something for uh, hopefully everybody will enjoy. And I believe it's going to be that first Friday, the Friday night. So Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I, I wasn't able to see it at the film festival. You know, you got so many things oh, going yes. in different directions. So. There was so many good things going on. Yeah, was, yeah and, and, and some things we intentionally skipped because we knew they were going to play again in a few months in Providence. So, you know, yeah. um, um, you know, I might, I might bore a few people with this question, guys, but I'll ask anyway since I've, I've got a bit of history with this. What What do you guys use to compose? Um, you know, obviously we all used to do it with pen and paper, 
or I would sit at a piano with with you know the treble and bass clef and go from there. You know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is uh, a, a sketch for the festival for the CD. Pencil and paper, but I also use uh, a computer, obviously. Yeah, what, what you guys want to talk a little bit about that process? I mean, what do you, do you guys use? Both use the same thing, or do you guys compose differently? Have you talked about that with each other? Yeah, we we have discussed software and and hardware, and uh, it's gotten a lot easier. There's less equipment in my studio, certainly. I used to have maybe five or six keyboards. Right. There's one, one keyboard, everything else is in the computer, and I have two uh, powered monitors, and uh, just some associated gear with that, and that's it. Well, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, I mean, I I do it occasionally. In theory, you can just use uh, composing software. You don't even need a keyboard. Obviously, it makes it easier, especially if you're a piano player. For but, me, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, uh, but um, yeah, but the software doesn't really do anything but make the, the make it look better and sound better. Uh, so far as the ideas and putting them on paper and organizing the ideas. Uh, I'm not sure how much the software really helps with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes it can actually hinder the process. I mean, yeah. Reber and I are both classically trained. Uh, trumpet for him and piano for me. I've been playing for many, many years, and I come from a performing background and played piano for everything. Uh, I was in a number of, of bands, acid rock bands and jazz bands and so on and so forth. So my my approach might be different than some of the younger composers these days, you know, that are born into the software and everything, because ultimately I'll still sit down at the piano. That is that is where I go um, to get my ideas out. And, and, you know, yes, there's software and keyboards and things, but, again, pen and paper sometimes are the best place to start for me. Um, you know, I still have my, some of my rig here. I used to play all over the place, and the rig was a real pain in the butt because it, it got to be such a haul. Yeah. Now these guys are carrying around a laptop with a keyboard, and they've got all this. The, essentially, all those keyboards are now in a piece of software, so right. it makes life easy. But but like Reber said, you can still have all that stuff and not have any talent or good ideas, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, do yeah. you guys find that you um, compose a great deal of it in your head before you put it down, or at least some portion. I, I'm trying to compare my small composing experience to you know what guys like you do that are, are really really good at it. And probably your, ex your experience is probably the same as ours. The the key things are your well one of is, is your memory. Once you yeah. do come up with an idea, you got to remember it, and then you got to write it down. And I actually that, I'll, I'll whistle or hum things into a recorder too if I think yeah. I've even got the possibility of forgetting it. Yeah, I tried that, and then I got tired of carrying the damn recorder. Over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, you can do it on your phone these days. So. Well, sure, right. Beethoven, Beethoven carried a small notebook when he would go on his walks. And, well, yeah. You know, we've got a number of writers here. Like, Joe, what has has the software changed your process to writing? Or did you, do you still go back to pen and paper? Um, my or desk you, you doesn't know what a tape writer is, is yet. <laughs> and I'm working on a story, and of course, page after page of notes. Right. You know, and I'll I'll open a file. Um. You know, there's a couple of there's two scenes in here. I opened the file. I knew that this was this scene came early. This came late. So I type them in the file, save the file, and then it's, you know, then it's back to pens. Right. And I things see. and things go in as I, as they come to me. Sometimes I'll write right in the file itself. Um. But, yeah. you know, it's it's these feel good in your hand. Perhaps it's because yeah. we're old, you know, and it's what we're used to. Um. I think it's more immediate. It's also tactile. I've got, like, I'll print out stuff like this, but then I'll make notes on it, go back and do my revisions, put them in the machine, print it out again. Yeah. That's what he's talking about. And I like the pen and pencil because it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's because we are old, but it's tactile. It's an actual physical relationship. Yeah, with the paper. yeah it, it, it's the reason I like physical books because I perceive, 
I perceive holding this as a tango. There's my the writer wrote it, and I'm reading it. I'm holding it. We're we're involved in a metaphysical dance or metaphoric dance. Yeah, you know. that makes sense. I agree. Um, See that. Uh, I should mention for everybody watching, we're going to give away. Uh, I'm going to give away a copy of of uh, the Whisper in Darkness here, uh, still in the package, to a random viewer. So if you're watching, keep watching. And um, Reaver has an extra copy of uh, the case of Charles Dexter Ward that he wants to give away to a, another random viewer. So absolutely. So. Um, yeah, if you haven't watched these movies, I think a lot of us have, but especially um, if you haven't listened to the audio dramas, I just can't say enough good about them. I just, uh, I've listened to a lot of audio drama. I think they hit the nail right on the head with these audio dramas. And, of course, the music has a lot to do with that, and that's why we're talking to you guys. So, um, what do you guys enjoy playing the most? And you guys play a variety of instruments. Right. Not in public. <laughs> I'm not asking. I'm not asking you to. But <laughs> I think I'd only play trumpet in public. Anything else? Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> I haven't played in public. Well, I you know we played in Portland, but I used to play every weekend, and so yeah, I did that. that whole, I mean, I did that for years and years and years and years and years. But uh, I'm hoping to get back into it again. I really would like to uh, get some sort of a group going. Um, but Troy, when you're sitting at home alone, nobody's listening to you. And, I mean, what kind of stuff are you? Do you like doing on the keyboard and so forth? Oh well, like I said, I'm classically trained, so I fall back on that. But I, I used yeah. to come home after school and improvise, you know. So whatever came to my mind, and and a lot of times, I guess you could probably say it was minimalistic, uh, ambient keyboards, new age, whatever you want to call it. Oh, um, guitar. Yeah, yeah, exactly, guitar. <laughs> I, I got all those called air pudding. Um, air pudding? <laughs> I haven't heard that one. <laughs> That's a good one. Pete uh, Rollick. I think I, I think uh, Pete Rollick is the world's greatest air guitarist. Oh. No, sorry, I've lost that title. Oh, you have? Yeah, I, I play the flute a lot, though. But you know. The air flute or the flute? The the air flute. <laughs> awesome. I I love Jethro Tull, so you'd have to do some of that. I want yeah. To see. Yeah. <laughs> We'll get them liquored up in uh, Providence. Uh, it doesn't take much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. If, I, if we're all going to be there, this is, could be trouble. <laughs> yeah, I hope. I think yeah, all well, of us are going to be there. We're all going to vote. Except for what, Rick. Here, five out of six of us here Rick. are going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. everybody but Rick. I think the local PD is bringing in extra, extra uh, officers for the weekend. I, I already checked on the leash laws. I'll be allowed in town. <laughs> on a leash. <laughs> no, 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 no. Without, without the leash. Oh, okay. But, yeah. but somebody mentioned the muzzle. Unfortunately. We oh. we should point out that Necronomicon does not yet have their liquor license. So. Um. Oh. <laughs> wow. I I thought I thought Rollick was bringing a couple of cases in his suitcase. Yeah, but just of Cristal. Oh, God. But I don't drink Cristal. Cristal. Exactly. Single malt, baby. Single malt. Single yeah, malt. Go. Jeez. That's good. That's good. I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can swing by Costco and pick up some. <laughs> Costco? I, you know, I Let's swear to God, I try to, I try, I really try, but I go to Costco and they say, here, try this. And I swear to God, it's a third of the price, and I can't tell the difference. Oh, okay. Well, well it's it's insane. I don't. Kel I, Kelly Young will be there. Mike Griffin will be there. All the single malt connoisseurs. So we'll you you bring it. We'll tell you. All right. So um. Good idea. And then we'll sing for these guys. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> the living Lovecraftian <laughs> love. The Living Lovecraftian Singer. That's a great idea. The Shadow. Oh of, yeah. Wait, yeah. The Shadow oh, is not Tabernacle Choir. Speaking of Lovecraftian horror. <laughs> <laughs> is there oh, I hope that these guys had some like uh, 
modern urban warfare kind of army earplugs because they need them if we start singing. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> we, we did have the day guy in Tabernacle Choir perform the uh, even scarier solstice songs at a screening. I don't know, it was years ago, but that was pretty well received. We were wearing these uh, specially made red sweaters with green light projected over us. It was really pretty horrific. <laughs> you were involved with that too, right? Yeah, I, I wrote, uh, arranged some of the music, almost well, all the music on, on even scarier solstice. Uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, again, assuming that, that people watching don't know what that is. And talk talk well, about that a little bit. Yeah, we, we uh, took well-known Christmas carols and tunes and, and bastardize them into uh, <laughs> horrible Lovecraftian renditions, uh, death to the world, you know, things like that. And uh, actually there was one original on there. We did the uh, Brumelian Wish, a poem that Lovecraft wrote, and I wrote that uh, original music. Um, and uh, Gallagher actually sang on that one too. So, mm. And a lot of th that type of thing went on years and years ago at the previous Necronomicons. At the prayer breakfast, you know, oh, we would do onward Cthulhuian soldiers, and <laughs> I, have, I have some of the printouts from back in the day. Um, but uh, and and that kind of stuff is a lot of fun when you get the, you know, three hundred Lovecraftians in in a, in a room on Sunday morning, and they didn't sleep at all. Oh yeah. Yeah, speaking of that, I wonder if, if Sean and those guys would... I, I videoed uh, the Cthulhu Prayer Breakfast in, um, in Portland, and a lot of people were pretty happy about that, to be able to watch it online, that they weren't there. I'll have to send a note to Sean and ask, if, ask him if he minds if I video you guys doing the Mountains of Madness at Necronomicon. I mean, he may, and if he does, I certainly see his point. But yeah, a, lot of people, a lot of people ask about that. If there, we could, could have done a webcast or somebody recorded it and yeah. you know, even thought about doing it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm surprised it was, uh, it was so well received. There were the, the audience, it was a full house, and everybody seemed to really like it. Well, my, you know, I'm pretty good at... Uh, like I said, there's a lot of stuff I'm not good at, but I'm, I'm pretty good at promotional sure. stuff, and I think that would... Probably airing something like that on YouTube or at the Lovecraft Easing would, I'm sure, result in more um, audio dramas purchased. So, Yeah, because if, and if you go back to all the previous Necronomicons and a lot of the film festivals, you know, coverage is, you know, here's some pictures, you know, right. here's my little report. Um, for all those people... and. I mean, even Troy just said, you know, hey, nobody's around me here. We're, we're all like that. Re Reber said that. Right. We, a lot of people don't get to part, to travel and participate in these things. And, and to get a better picture of what it's like when you have the filmmakers and the writers and the musicians all gathered together and the... the what you're experiencing from, you know, from panels or lectures or or, or films or, or live performances. Um, I mean, the, there's mountains of people out there who would just eat this stuff up. And yeah. it, it really allows the community to see what goes on. And, and I think that just makes them want to obtain the product more makes them want to come to the next convention more. Uh, it's Yeah, I got some pretty pretty nice emails from people thanking me for, for posting the Cthulhu breakfast, and that's just, uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of people can't make it. I mean, I was fortunate enough, that I don't have the money to go, but, you know, the fans paid for, for me to go, and I thought, you know, I had to pay them back by making sure that this was covered better than it ever had been before, so... You know, yeah. you know, Necronomicon's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, um, and, and, and I, I do think that the coverage of the last film festival between you, um, Mike Griffin's report, Mike Griffin's great job, yeah. and me, though, I think those were really well received by all those people who couldn't attend because you've got in-depth looks. You've got to, you know, you, 
Mike walked around the dealer's room with his video camera and talked to some of the people who were there. A, a lot of people know that, yeah, there is a dealer's room, and I'm going to see some really cool stuff, but they don't know in depth what the stuff is. They, they don't get to actually look at the table and go, oh, my God, look at those T-shirts. Yeah, one oh. thing I did not do, though, Joe, is I did not go back into the far back into the ritual sacrifice room. <laughs> I, I left that off, and I don't know. Maybe I can do that at Necronomicon. I don't that, know. Was, that was in the green room. Yeah, you want to leave oh, something yeah. to the imagination. <laughs> I, I hate it when people put their tentacles all over me. Yeah. <laughs> well, right? Like I said, that was in the green room. Space. I won't be doing that again. <laughs> You know, this Troy, is my personal space, and you keep your tentacles off of me. Troy, you're in North Dakota? That is correct. Yep. Where? I'm on the western portion in a town called Kildeer. It's north of Dickinson. Okay. Uh, Badlands area. Let's there right now. No, I, I, was, I was born in Minot, so. Oh, really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we well, got out quick. Yeah, I'm from Mandan, Bismarck, originally, so never left and trapped. <laughs> how, how are the autumns there? Oh, they're beautiful. That's probably the best time of year. Yeah. yeah the only good time of year, really. <laughs> what's what's well, the temperature I, today? Like, it's, it's what, mid-June? Oh, it's like 70s, probably. I don't know. I didn't look. Um, yeah. But I wanted to comment on the you know, what Joe was touching on. At the Lovecraft Film Festival, the thing I like about it is that everybody is so accessible and willing to just mingle. You know, I'd never met Joe before, and, and he was a celebrity to me, so when I saw him standing outside, it was it was a pretty uh, profound moment to meet him and, and a lot of these other people that are creating in different realms of Lovecraft. And so, like he said, you know, if, if it's more accessible to people that don't have that opportunity to go, um, then that's just helping build that family. You know, I really look forward to, to Providence because I've never been there, and for me, it's going to be a personal like pilgrimage almost because I, I want to take in the city and see where he's buried and all that sort of thing. And uh, I think it'll be a pretty, uh, pretty profound moment. So I'm looking I'm, forward. I'm right with you on that because I, I too have never been there, and I feel the same way about it. No. And thanks, Troy. I, I appreciate that. Um, but you know, if as members of this community. Um, if, if we go all the way back to Lovecraft himself and the original serpents, and, and we've all talked about this previously, I don't know how many times here, but it's, this is a group of inclusion. Love, Lovecraft included the younger writers. Um, these, these guys reached out. Uh, Robert Block is just a fan when he starts talking to Lovecraft. There's a precedent that was set, and... I put on my pants the same way as everybody else does. I, I sit here and write, and without a reader. That's not I'm what Cat no says. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, you know, we're not going to get into those horror stories. I should point um, out that pants are not necessary for these video chats. We just uh, oh, don't tell Rollick that. My God. I'm not wearing pants. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, so it's important. It's important to meet you guys. I mean, you what 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 you guys do musically is, is I I if 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 I could pick a creative talent, I'd play guitar. But these things, you know, arthritis and broken knuckles and that would never happen. So I'm envious of what you do. So it's a pleasure for me to get to talk to you guys, to get insight into how you work. Um you know, Artists, the fil again, the filmmakers, the musicians, the writers, we are all part of the same community. We're all interested in the same thing. Um, some of us are envious of someone else's talent. And without the fans and without the readers and the listeners, we are nothing. We are people who sit in our rooms all by ourselves. <laughs> Those people, when they come up to you at a convention and... They want a CD signed or a book signed. That's the applause. Yeah. And there's nothing, nothing more glorious than someone coming up and saying, I really <laughs> loved your book. Would you sign it? That's I right. mean, your feet literally leave the ground. 
It's amazing. Um, it's an amazing feeling because I've worked. I know I've worked. All of us have worked in isolation, and then all of a sudden yeah. somebody said, "Good job." I enjoy what you do. It's like, wow, this is fantastic. Yeah, right before I went to Portland a couple days, I think it was a couple days before, I got this email from this guy, and he's like, I really like the Lovecraft easy, and I was just made aware of it. And uh, I was like, I, I showed it to my wife, and I was like, man, this is the composer for those movies that I really like. So I was pretty flattered when Troy emailed me, and, and it was great to meet you guys at the at the film festival. Yeah. So. It's good to meet you as well. Yeah. And, and yeah, the other I thing so, is... I don't show her many emails I get, Troy, but I showed her that one, so... <laughs> and everybody seems to be really nice, for the most part. I mean, I would say 98% of people we are seem good people. We seem to be. <laughs> well, but you yeah, well, you know, ritual sacrifice room. <laughs> I may be a good man, but I'm not a nice man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's still the family part of the show. We haven't been got to past the hour mark, so I'm not going to comment on that, Raleigh. <laughs> well, speaking but, uh, of that, the FBI did share quite a bit of new information with me this week. Yeah, I'm sure. Because you, know, oh. you apparently were very, very busy boy. A actually, I do have new Raleigh information. So. Oh. Yeah, I shared it with you. Yeah, you remember? Uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They emailed yes. me back. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's it's I, still I, no more information than we had before, but yes. Yeah. No, but it was. It was better. It, it was an answer where before they weren't replying at all, but now that I think we got some new management. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Mike. Tell them. Yeah. Oh, what, what is it? Skyhorse is that the name of? Yeah, they're Skyhorse. Taking, they've taken over uh, the old. Place. I don't know if you want me to say the name or not. Yeah, and, yeah uh, Nightshade Books got bought out by Skyhorse, and that deal is done. Yeah, so I, I basically emailed Skyhorse, and I said, you know, I've been sending a lot, a ton, a hell of a lot of readers to the Amazon <laughs> pre-order page for reanimators, and, you know, I keep getting asked, you know, when is this book actually coming out? And they, they actually replied and, and said, we'll know more in mid-June, which... Probably means July, but still, it's an answer, and and uh, it's it's in the work. So it, it was encouraging. I thought it was anyway. Yeah. The um the addendum to that is that while it's not on Amazon's website, on Audible.com's website, which is owned by Amazon, right. The release date for the audio version is July sixteenth. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Which is the same date that they're now promoting for the book. Huh. So, I don't know well, what. I'm that glad means. you said that because tomorrow, either tonight or tomorrow, I'm posting the the Pete Rollick stealing my stealing the car to see Reanimator's adventure, and I'm going oh, to post. Oh God! I'm going to post to the. I'll link to the book and to the Audible because I. I'm glad you said that because I wasn't thinking about Audible. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it, for anybody who know what doesn't know already, there's a story about how when I was a. 17-year-old kid, I stole a car to go see Reanimator. <laughs> that was my grandmother's car, True but it was story. still stealing. Yeah. A uh, dedicated fan. <laughs> dedicated. Well, I, um, I grew up outside of Philadelphia, which got, like, no art house films or whatnot. And in, in 85, it's, it's Reanimator is a nothing film. Right. No one's going to be showing that in my neighborhood. And I had to drive, like, an hour to get to some... Uh, giant movie theater complex that had it on this tiny little backroom screen. Yeah. So, yeah. And it was NC-17 at the time. Who was uh, NC-17? Are you serious? Yeah. It was under 17, not admitted. It was in X. Yeah. That, yeah there's not that much nudity in it, though, really. No, but it was at X for violence. Oh, okay. So you were 17, Pete? Was that? I was 17. And you run the borderline. Yeah. So nobody, my my parents were going to take me. My mom wasn't going to take me. Up until that point, Pete had never seen a woman unclothed before. <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding? By that time, I had like three ex-wives. <laughs> you, you needed an older brother. 
<laughs> That's how I got to see Last Tango in Paris. Oh, oh dude, no. <laughs> see, no, what he needed is this. Because at 16, they started letting me in everywhere. Well, I had a full beard at, at 14. You know, my fe my first pitcher of beer was in a college bar, and the guy didn't want to serve me. And his wife said, "You didn't grow a beard till you were thirty. Just <laughs> just hand him the beer." Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of the giveaways, and then we can get back on topic. But if I'll 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 randomly pick from anyone who emails me. Um, Reber will send them this, and I'll send. Uh, uh, Whisper in Darkness. Um, email me at lovecrafteasing at gmail dot com. Um, be Lovecraft Easy I N E at gmail dot com, and just tell me you're watching, and we'll we'll pick two people randomly to win this stuff. And hey, Mike. Uh, all right, now let's get back to Pete Relic's criminal activities. No, no, no. Troy wants to say something. Okay. Well, awesome. yeah, he's he's the guest. I was just gonna say, if you want to uh, pick a third, I'll send them a random. Uh, horrific something. <laughs> that sounds great. I'll, I'll pick three people. Might not get any takers for that intro, but whatever. <laughs> well, it, I got a hand up. <laughs> How much is the... Um, Troy, you're doing some great work. Anything you want. <laughs> yeah, I, I would take anything Troy or Reaver sent me. Um, and by the way, thanks, Reaver. Careful what you wish for. <laughs> uh, thanks for sending me a cart case of Charles Dexter Ward, by the way. So. Sure, sure. Uh, when is Out of the Eons going to be, I mean, I'm sorry, I already asked that question. How much is it going to be, is what I was going to say. Well, do you guys know that? There, yeah. There's three tunes apiece, four, four composers, you know, I mean, whatever the going iTunes rate is, I would think. Yeah. Is is there any chance that we're going to get physical product for those of us old people who still relish holding these things in our hand? No, he's not going to give you an eight track. No. <laughs> I told I know. We've talked about producing a physical CD, but uh, different logistics, so we don't know. Yeah, I. Oh, I, oh, I realize it's different logistics. I just wanted to know if there was any possibility. There's it's about a wax cylinder. There's a possibility. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I definitely go for vinyl. Yeah, in 1985, yeah, vinyl. In 1985, Pete steals a car to go see Reanimators. That same year, I rode my. I'm a little bit younger. I rode my skateboard to the mall to <laughs> to buy a, a LP of uh, the Back to the Future soundtrack. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> see Lewis in the news. Well, I'm old. That's and then, I, then I'm carrying this. I'm carrying this daughter. this record all the way down back home, like uh, a mile back home, under my arm as I'm skateboarding back home. Can't wait to yeah. listen to Huey Lewis. Yeah. Nice. Wow. So. Yeah. Wow. Th thanks for making us feel ancient. Because my first my first LP was Fresh Cream. <laughs> About two months after it came out. So, That's what I'm here for. You, pardon me? That's what I'm here for. Make you feel yeah. I appreciate yeah. that. Love you, Davis. You son yeah. Of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my oldest daughter was born in 85, so yeah, I'm feeling a little old. Oh. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah, well, my wife was still in diapers, so. You know. Wow. Yeah. You, you like them young. <laughs> no, she likes them old. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. She saw the yacht, thought he had money. Sure. Uh, there you go. You know, he offered her crystal, got her all liquored up. Well, Poor girl yeah. didn't know what she was saying. Actually, from what I understand, it was my signed copy of Dune that got her through the door. Yeah. Cool. So, Frank Herbert does that to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. What? You get a girl who's turned on by 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 giant sandworms, you done all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she saw Beetlejuice. Yep. <laughs> uh, any? Uh, do you guys know? Is there any other um, audio dramas in the works? I understand they're pretty tight-lipped about stuff, but they've been talking uh, no, about space. 
Yeah, Sorry. I think you announced that there will definitely be two more in the works, uh, Colorado Space and Herbert West, where the two that are coming up. I don't know what the order is yet, but... Yeah. Huh. Pete, Rowlick, Pete Rowlick wants the order to Herbert West right now. Oh. Yeah. Yep, don't steal a car. Out. Don't steal a car. Don't steal a car? No. I'm sure we can get it to you some other way. Okay. <laughs> it might take a boat at this point. My neighborhood's flooded out. Yeah. Hey, know. join the club. Troy just had a flooding adventure. I had a flooding adventure. Yeah. yeah. I work for the agency that does flood control. Oh, man. So yeah, you, I'm in the only part of Germany that didn't get flooded in the last couple of weeks. Wow. Flood Brothers. <laughs> yeah. Reber and Troy, did your houses get flooded or what happened? Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah. It's like a hundred year flood event here. We had we we've never gotten water in this house. We got seven feet in the basement. Oh wow. We took out everything. The electrical panel, the H V A C the the water heater. Yeah, so it's been a big insurance nightmare, but uh, we're almost back up to speed. Troy, Troy had a, a a sewer pipe bust or something. What was it? Yeah, I didn't have anything like Reber, but at the uh, the end, the result is pretty much uh, gutting the basement and moving the studio, and that's it's a mess in here right now. But yeah, yeah. So. Well, I was in Des Moines, Iowa, where I'm from, in '93, and. Uh, yeah, that was like a hundred year flood too. I mean, parts of that's the capital city of Iowa and parts had never been flooded, like the baseball stadium, it was all underwater and we we all actually lost it hit it hit the waterworks, so we actually had no water to drink for like a week. They had to you turn on the faucet, nothing would happen. Wow. So that was quite an experience. I was born in Des Moines. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. I know the spots. That's that's something. That's amazing. Yeah. Let's, yeah, hope sure. it yeah. Let's hope it's not a trend. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's prepping for the uh, great old ones to rise again or yeah, something. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Who wrote Brian Keene's Earthworm Guides? Has anybody else read that? No. Uh, I don't think I have. So, yeah, I guess the, 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 the sea level rises 20 feet and all the giant worms come out of the ground. Is it a good book or is it? I enjoyed it. It's it's vaguely Lovecraftian because there are other things, you know, rising up out of the ocean now, stalking the the, the shallows. Yeah. And when I sh say shallows, I mean like the Poconos. So. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's and I guess there's a there's a sequel as well. I'm trying to remember which ranking book I have. It's oh yeah, there it is. It's uh oh yeah, darkness on the edge of town. That's pretty Lovecraftian. Have you read that one? I think so. Basically, about this town where uh, it it everything outside the border is just dark. Anybody that walks out there disappears. It's like they're the last place on earth, or like the universe yeah. ended or the great old ones came and there's there, this crazy guy this homeless guy basically saved the town the only reason why it swelled up is he put these 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 symbols on the borders so it, it's pretty lucky yeah. in a B movie sort of way <laughs> so. well thanks for being here guys sure You're welcome. Enjoyed it. thanks so much yeah really appreciate it um, Wait, else? I have a question. Yeah. I mean, all right, so when I think horror music, my personal, you know, go-to guy is John Carpenter. Okay. Because, you know, it's easy to score your own movies, apparently. Right. But well, um, He works with Alan Hobart, too, I think. Right, right. But who do you guys, whose inspiration, who's... Yeah, um, Bernard Herrmann. Bernard Herrmann all the way. I, okay. I, I yep, and that's my answer, too. Yep, just fantastic. I, I was going to say that too. The Lodger is great. What is? Well, if, if you look, at, if, oh, not the Lodger. It's um, Hangover Square. Hangover Square. I don't really know that. I don't know it. And this was Laird Kreger. It's a uh, about a uh, schizophrenic piano uh, player. Oh well. The yeah. composer. We all know that guy. <laughs> I think Troy and I both know plenty of schizo piano people. Yeah. <laughs>
you know, speaking of John Carpenter, I really enjoyed it's it's a very simple intro, but I really enjoyed um the way the music started in the fog, where they do the Ed, Edgar Allan Poe quote at the beginning. Right. And uh, I think that was a 1980 movie, probably, right? Something like yeah. that. Yeah, it's around there. Yeah. 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 And the little piano sequence in the beginning, it was very, very effective. So. Yeah. Uh, there's a great series of books by a guy named Randall Larson that covers uh, horror music uh, from the beginning. And uh, I think book one is out now. It's called Music Fa Music Fantastique. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me put you on the big screen here. There you go. Why do we know that name, Joe? Who's Randall Larson? Yeah, I, why do I know that name? He's, he's done uh, story. I know him, too, from somewhere. I think he's done criticism and stories. I've, I've read yeah, things. Yeah, I think it's crit he's a critic, and, uh, but it's, a, it's really great. I know book one is really nice. There's supposed to be a whole series of them. And it covers everything. I mean, we're starting in the 1920s, late 20s. The early 30s and going on. I think this one goes through the 60s. <laughs> so, I got an email. I got an email here. Could you? I have a question for the composer with the bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the subject of the email. I was waiting for one of those. <laughs> yeah. You knew that was. Yes, coming. I'm a Doctor Who fan. Okay, I said it. <laughs> no. Hey, bow ties are cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm wrong with a bow tie. I thought, but I thought that's too obvious. I'm not going to say that. So, Big okay. time. The question is, could you ask him what synthesizers slash keyboards he has on the stand behind him and what he uses for composing? I am a fellow musician, producer, composer, so always interested in what's in other people's collections. So. Okay, so at the bottom there is a vintage ARP Omni keyboard. They used to have these, It's actually, the case is actually metal, it weighs a ton. And they had this outboard analog unit you'd plug into to get your different patches. There's some built-in ones, but that's, you know, late 70s, early 80s. Um, in the middle there, that's an Emu keyboard orchestral series, and then on top of it is a Poly 800. And then on the very top, I don't want to show it quite yet, but it's a it's a little um, USB keyboard that I'm. It was what I used in Portland, and I'm giving it a Lovecraftian paint job. Oh wow. So, it's going to look like bleeding tentacles, essentially. And, uh, can, you so, send me a, can you send me a picture of that when you're done? Yeah, I'll definitely. I'll post it on the, the Facebook page. I figured I'd That's stick it on our HPLHS site or whatever. It'll be fun. It's going to have eyeball knobs, you know. So, yeah, it'll be cool. Um, and then, you know, I've got various other keyboards and pianos and stuff. I kind of collect all that stuff. I'm still a, an outboard junkie. I love it. But uh, software-wise, Reaper and I both on the PC side use Sonar. Um, I also on the I, on the Mac side, I got into the uh, Logic Digital Performer, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Software-wise, it's horse apiece. Everybody goes and gets library software and whatnot. So that's what I use. Hmm. Yeah, so you're, you're Joe right. Zalwin only in a bow tie with hair. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I, I like that uh, Matt Smith brought back the bow tie for Doctor Who. You know, uh, the first few Doctors back in the day with Patrick Troughton, he wore bow ties, so that was cool and actually made it cool again. Um, but, you know, Matt Smith is done in December, and hopefully my bet, my hope is that uh, Martin Freeman becomes our next Doctor. So for all you Doctor Who fans out there. <clears throat> I've I've really been enjoying. Um, I mean, I, I I do like him as Doctor Who, and the story arc with Amy Pond and so forth was was pretty good. But I'm really enjoying the 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 second half of season seven. I'm watching those on on Amazon. You know, oh, more so than you haven't anything. seen you haven't seen the last one. <laughs> no, I I've seen the first four. You know, with with the Clara girl who died Clara's twice or something. No spoilers. <laughs> yeah, no spoilers. Although I, I, I was thinking about it this morning, and I'm, without looking it up or anything, which I don't want to do. Um, I'm thinking she might be a reincarnation of a former companion or something. But I'll find out. Oh, it's better than that. You, you you'll find out in the last episode. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm really I'm really enjoying it. So. I, I hope they bring, you know, they keep telling us in December it's going to change the way we think about Doctor Who and stuff. And 
so on and so forth, and the speculation about a woman doctor and all that. I'm like, well, whatever. But they should they should bring back uh, Lady Romana. You know, everybody wants a female Time Lord. Bring back Lady Romana. We know she's stuck somewhere. We got to see her regenerate once. <clears throat> bring her back. I think they killed her off in the audio dramas. Oh, I never caught that. I, I haven't. I haven't heard, seen those, but I think he's in uh, in the Time <clears throat> War uh, sequence. Uh, well, well but, but they can always say we don't care about that. So, would that be part of the official storyline, though, in the audio? Yeah, well, it, it, it depends if they want to follow it or not. I, yeah. I don't know what the how, how they do with the audio dramas. They don't okay. care about the books. Yeah. So no, they, was, they actually uh, could if they wanted to. You know, since the BBC, I, I just love their programming lately. It's been amazing. I don't know if any yeah. of you caught Life on Mars, but that was a fantastic yeah. series. And I just... <laughs> they're trying to get better and better. You know, uh, Sherlock, I loved it. Uh, yeah. It's fantastic. And Martin Freeman is amazing. You know, why not a Lovecraftian serial like that? I know they well, do it. There was one. They did one a long time ago. They did? Really? Yeah, I think it only lasted three episodes. What was it? Um, I'll have to con con consult my Lovecraft Goes of the Movies. Or you could just ask Rick. Are you, th are you thinking Rough Magic, which was only one episode? No, it was... No, it starts out with a, 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 a little kid or, or a mother sacrificing her kid. That's, that's oh, yeah, Rough I Magic. That. Is that that's, Rough Magic? That is that's Rough Magic. magic. Yeah. I, I thought that was, it was that good. Series. It just didn't last. It didn't make it. They only, they only did one episode of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, did, I didn't think it was that good. Did you guys? I, I thought it was, for the time, I thought it was a good attempt to do yeah. <laughs> to do what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, I thought it had potential if there had been more episodes. Yeah. What do you have there, Reaver? What? Oh, I don't know. What, what, you, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> messing around. Just messing around. He, he got the Illuminati. <laughs> hey Troy, going yeah. back to Doctor Who real quick. When he yeah. kills the master and sets his body on fire, some yeah. chick hand comes out and gets the ring. Yeah, yeah. They, had, they, they had they had that. They explained who that was. Who? Um, I think it was uh, it was a female follower of his because he came well, back to the last David Tennant one. Yeah, okay. no, no, there was a female time. Other another female time. Well, Ronnie. Lord. The Ronnie, yeah, that's who it was. Yeah. But yep. not, not, it was in the last episode was David Tennant. Where they, okay. They brought back the Alifree. They, 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 had, they showed you how they revived the master. All right. Yeah. yeah. I'm obviously behind on my, my Doctor Who lore. Well, I've been watching since 1982, and so, you know, that's quite a few doctors. Yeah. Well... Yeah, it, it, like I said, I, I, I enjoy, I'm enjoying Matt Smith, and I enjoyed the Amy Pond River Song thing, but but I'm I'm really enjoying, uh, I forget, her, what's her last name, Clara? Something. Oswald. Yeah, Oswald, I'm really... Uh, Oz, I'm really I think it's Oswin. Yeah. I think it's Oswin. I think it's Clara Oswald Oswin or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The okay. last time yeah. I saw, I had the guy with the scarf. Tom Baker. Tom Baker. Yeah, that, that's the guy. Yeah. How many people who watch the seventh season know that the great intelligence is, is an old Patrick Troughton villain? Yeah, well, yeah. there was a reference to it. Yeah, the, the underground. Yep. Well, you guys know, I mean, John Hurt is going to be the, uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, he popped up during Colin Baker's reincarnation. Um, Bill, the Bill Bill the yeah. bail yard? Yeah. 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 That's who John Hurt is. So I just, well, no, my head exploded. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, because there's only like eight actors in Britain, so. <laughs> yeah, I guess. What, John Hurt's God? He yeah. Is. yeah I mean, I watch Scandal once a month. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if he has a chest burster t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that will haunt him the rest of his life. That's yeah. what uh, my sense said. Who's, who's this guy? I said he's a guy whose chest blew open an alien. Yeah, yeah that, yeah. Said, that's, uh, that's what my son will know. Our 1984, I guess. Uh, See, every time I think of John Hurt, I think of 
A Man for All Seasons or Scandal first? Yeah. I think 1984 would be like the third thing to pop into my head. And as much as I love Alien, I think that would be, I'm not sure that would be top five. Well, I, I remember him as Quentin Crisp going oh. way back. Oh, oh. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, looks like I got another question, you guys. I guess it's pretty much for everybody. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, enjoying, as always, the live show. I uh, want to know if you or any of your intrepid Lovecraftian crew. Oh, that's a game. Okay, that's. Uh, are going to be attending. Uh, I'm I want to be the navigator. Okay. <laughs> I want to be um, security. Got to be a stolen car, though. Those guys get killed. Just don't call him a sidekick, right? Yeah. Well, all right, bouncer. <laughs> yeah, you can be the bouncer. You've got experience with that. There's no reason for the navigator to go down to the surface. Absolutely none. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the navigator will not touch the strippers. And no one here is wearing a red shirt. So, anyway. right, so what was the question? <laughs> if any of you are going to be attending the Lovecraft Film Festival in September in Los Angeles, I live close enough to be going to that. Uh, that's the first question. Uh, I, I went one year and really enjoyed it. There's a great pub there called the Whale and Ale. Yeah. Highly recommend it. <laughs> so we all have our priorities straight. It's <laughs> that's right. Alcohol first. That's, that's yeah. Well, even even Lovecraftians congregate in the bar. Yeah, that's right. Libraries are closed then at that time. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. If if the librarians would serve tea, we would. Co well, I would I would congregate there. Well, I think the answer is none of us are going. I know I'm not. Not, not to this one, Kent. I can't no. get the yacht from Providence to L.A. Yeah. Uh, in a month. Yeah, I'm I afraid can't. earthquakes. Uh, it's always something. Floods, earthquakes. Also, if you might Never give out some links for products being sold at Providence. I know many of us are sad not to be attending, but are very interested in the awesome wares being being offered. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. I should, I should, while I'm there, I should do a list of the vendors. So. Right, and and one of the things is a, a lot of the various products being offered are offered day in and day out via Arkham Bazaar. Right. Yeah. Whether it's the Whisper in Darkness or T-shirts. Great website. Some books, but our Arkham Bazaar will have a, a, a pretty good sampling of a, a lot of the products that are there. So and they have PLHS too, and uh, yeah, there's a whole yeah, bunch of, yeah, a lot of stuff, and they ship all over the world. So absolutely, yeah, you betcha. So yeah, um, thanks for being here, guys. Oh, thanks for having us. Thanks for my, having us. my son just arrived from elsewhere, so I'm going to go spend some time with him. Yeah. So. Um, appreciate all you guys being here, and really looking forward to, to seeing you guys again at um, Necronomicon. So yeah, we'll be there. Yeah, August, brothers. That's awesome. it. Awesome. Uh, let's see, June. Wow. Yeah, we're getting on only what ten weeks away, something like that. Yeah. 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 Time to start uh, <laughs> spreading the news far and wide on Facebook. Yeah. We'll really yeah. crank it up. Yeah. It's not very. It's not very long, really. So. No. So, and uh, I I picked uh, three people, and I'll let um, Reaver and Troy know. Someone actually emailed and said, uh, "I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by the random horrific something." So I'm going to send that that lady to Troy. So, so anyway, thanks for being.